anyone say hello? That was the voice. This part of the battlefield where I'm standing right now is where the American third line would have met the British line. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse was fought in March of 1781 and is one of the most important battles of the American Revolutionary War. After the embarrassing defeat at the Battle of Saratoga and the entrance of France and Spain into the war, the British were looking for new ways to defeat the Americans quickly. Over in England, Parliament was becoming increasingly frustrated at the lack of success and the costs that were starting to mount in order to fund the war. People in England were becoming increasingly frustrated also at the lack of success and also the heavy taxes that were levied on them in order to fund the war. The new strategy the British would come up with would be called the Southern Campaign, and this was the genius idea of General Sir Henry Clinton. Clinton would raise a new army and would sail from New York into the southern colonies and he would establish a British foothold in Georgia and South Carolina and then would send out small units into the back countries of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia in order to recruit people that were loyal to the crown. The British assumed that most people in the southern colonies were loyalists, which meant that they were loyal to the British, and that once the British had established dominance in the southern colonies, they would flock to the British lines. Charleston would not be an easy city to take though, and the British faced fierce resistance from American and South Carolina state troops upon entering the outskirts of the city. A siege was declared. Now inside the city, things were not looking good for the Americans. Frequent arguments between South Carolina state government officials and the state governor with General Benjamin Lincoln and other Continental officers led to a split. The government was not happy with the toll that was being taken on the civilians of the city. Many of them had been wounded and killed by British bombardments. In Lincoln, they saw was being obstinate and was not willing to meet the British in a fair battle. This led to eventually the South Carolina state troops being pulled out of the city and the state government evacuating the city, leaving the Americans all alone and defenseless. One of the major problems the British faced when besieging Charleston, South Carolina, were all the roads that led in and out of the city. In order to take Charleston, they would have to secure all of these roads so that the American army could not escape. General Sir Henry Clinton would not accept any terms of surrender unless it included the complete and utter surrender of all American forces in the Carolinas, and therefore he would not negotiate with Lincoln, and Lincoln, in return, would not negotiate with the British. One by one, Clinton started sending out small detachments, mainly of light cavalry and infantry, to take these roads, and they would meet some resistance, but they would mostly take these roads with ease. The final nail in the American coffin would be at the Battle of Monk's Corner, when American sentries were surprised late one night by British troops led by Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton and would be routed into the South Carolina wilderness. With all the roads being taken by British, the Americans were forced to surrender a short time later. It was the largest American defeat and surrender of the American Revolutionary War, and the British now had a firm foothold in the southern colonies to begin their campaign. The Battle of Waxhaws was fought on May 29, 1780 near the South Carolina and North Carolina border and would become known as Buford's Massacre. American troops under the command of Abraham Buford were retreating into North Carolina after failing to reach Charleston to aid in the defense of the city. Clinton and Cornwallis would dispatch Bannister Tarleton and the British Legion to hunt them down and defeat them in battle. These were the last of the American Continentals in the South, and their defeat would be a huge blow to American morale and recruiting efforts. Tarleton only had about 150 men with him, and Buford had about 450, almost 500 men. Buford declined a demand of surrender from Tarleton, and the two sides lined up for battle. Most of the American troops had never been in battle before and were tired from their long march south and now their march north. Tarleton ordered his men to charge the Americans, and he led the charge from the front with his dragoons himself. The Americans barely got off a shot before they started running away, 
Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding what happened next, but according to accounts of soldiers who fought in the battle, the Americans threw up the white flag of surrender and the British began rounding up the prisoners. Suddenly, a shot rang out and Tarleton was pinned under his horse, having it shot out from under him. His bodyguard assumed he had been killed and his troops began killing the Americans for breaking the truce. It was a complete massacre, and most of the American soldiers were unarmed at this point, but were still killed in brutal ways. When Tarleton regained consciousness, he condemned the officers who ordered the charge, and the surviving Americans would be given medical aid by the British before being sent to Charleston. The cry of Tarleton's quarter became the rally cry of American patriots in the backcountry and made the Civil War in the South even more violent as patriots won revenge for the killings. By taking Charleston, South Carolina, the British now had a strong foothold in the southern colonies. General Sir Henry Clinton quickly dispatched many detachments of British infantry and dragoon units into the back countries to recruit locals to join the British ranks, as well as secure loyalty from towns and officials. Clinton decided to return to New York, and he would turn over reins of the campaign to Lord Charles Cornwallis, who had just returned from mourning his wife's death in England. Charles Cornwallis was a capable commander and was known as one of the finest in the British Army at the time, and it was seen that if anyone could get the campaign done, it would be him. The British started meeting fierce resistance, though, from local populations, and it quickly became apparent that there was a civil war brewing in South Carolina between patriots and loyalists. There would be many skirmishes fought in the Carolinas between loyalists and patriots, and in South Carolina alone, there would be over 130 battles fought where there wasn't a single British soldier in sight. It truly was a civil war. Meanwhile, things were not going well for the British Loyalists. The fighting in South Carolina's backwoods had turned in favor of the Patriots who were able to unify under various commanders and coordinate attacks that would attack major Loyalist strongholds. It didn't help also that Patrick Ferguson's Loyalist force of over a thousand men had been surrounded and defeated by the Over Mountain Men and Virginia Militia. This was a heavy blow because Cornwallis thought that Ferguson was the perfect commander to go through the Carolinas and recruit men to the British cause, and ideally he would go through western North Carolina and potentially go into Virginia. However, after his defeat, this would not happen. The British efforts would be slowed down by American partisans mainly led by General Francis Marion, Andrew Pickens, and Thomas Sumter. Washington, back north, was able to convince Congress to send his man in order to lead the next Continental Army, and he chose General Nathaniel Green, one of his right-hand men. He also sent General Daniel Morgan, one of the heroes of Saratoga, with him to help train and raise a militia army that was capable of holding their own against the British. Upon reaching the southern colonies, they would meet the British, but would not engage in open combat. This was because Green knew he couldn't stand up to the British in open field combat, mainly because the American troops that he had had never seen battle before and were mostly made up of untrained militia. Green and Morgan began enacting guerrilla warfare and guerrilla campaigns against the British in order to attack their supply lines, disrupt communication, and decrease recruiting efforts. They were also able to sway many people that were loyalists to joining the American cause, much to the ire of the British, who at this point were almost giving up on the southern backwoods due to the fierce civil war and hornet's nest that they had stirred up. So Cornwallis started figuring out a plan to get all of his forces together in Charleston, South Carolina and march and defeat Green. The Battle of Cowpens was fought on January 17, 1781 and is regarded as one of the most brilliant battle strategies of all time. Morgan with a force of about 1,700 men would face Tarleton with a force of about 1,200 men. Tarleton had run his men ragged trying to chase down Morgan and they were tired, hungry, and in no condition to fight. However, Tarleton would wake them up early in the morning on the 17th and line them up for battle. Morgan's plan was genius, it was basically a double envelopment. He positioned his army against the river so they couldn't escape and he spread the message that if you didn't fight, you would be killed. He lined his men up in three lines, with cavalry on the flanks to protect them, 
The first line was militia and he ordered them to fire two volleys before falling back to the rear. The second line would be sharpshooters with long rifles and they would deal heavy damage to the British before falling back. The third line was Morgan's best troops and the militia would ideally reform and flank the British. Morgan assumed Tarleton would deploy in a single battle line and charge, which is what Tarleton had done at the Battle of Waxhaws, and it's exactly what he would end up doing at Cowpens. Most of the militia only got off a single volley before running, and Tarleton assumed they were running away, so he ordered a charge. It is interesting to note that this was the only battle that Tarleton did not lead from the front. The British fell into the American trap, and after intense fighting that went back and forth, a melee broke out on the left flank. The Americans almost lost the battle, but regimental officers were able to rally their men and cavalry led by William Washington saved the day for the Americans. Tarleton, who stayed at the back of the battle the entire time, tried to lead a charge himself, but no one would join him. He would almost be killed when William Washington's legion caught up to him, but his bodyguards would rescue him. The British were totally defeated, and they limped back to Cornwallis in shame. Morgan wouldn't pursue the British because he had taken heavy casualties himself and he was suffering from severe back pain and he would retire shortly after to his home. The race to the dam was one of the most important moments of the war and ultimately led to the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Greene knew he couldn't beat the British in open combat so he split his army in two with Daniel Morgan commanding the other army. The plan was to lure the British far away from their supply lines and slowly weaken them until they were vulnerable enough to attack. Upon hearing of the American forces splitting, Cornwallis would do the same. He would send Tarleton with some of his best troops to go after Morgan before linking back up with him. Tarleton was about 26 years old at this point and lacked the military training the other commanders had, but he was by far the most successful British officer in the South. Many officers would protest Tarleton being put in charge, and they would ultimately be proven right. The goal was to catch the Americans before they reached the Dan River, or else they would be reinforced by fresh soldiers and supplies in territory the British weren't familiar with. Daniel Morgan was great at recruiting, training, and motivating men, and Green hoped that he would be able to recruit many men into his army and have them well trained before linking back up with him in Virginia. There would be many skirmishes between the four men, and slowly, attrition would eat away at the British. There wouldn't be another large battle until January of 1781, when Tarleton would catch up with Morgan at the Battle of the Cowpens. After receiving word of the victory at Cowpens, Green was ecstatic, and he would open up a little bit to the militia. You see, at that time, militia was regarded as the lowest forms of soldiers, and in the rules of war, typically you wouldn't put militia in front lines. They would only be used as garrisons and for escorting prisoners of war. Green decided to spare some of his Continental units, mainly his Dragoon legions, especially under Light Horse Harry Lee, to aid in some of these partisan fighters. Most notably, Light Horse Harry Lee, who would be the father of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, would go help General Francis Marion fight his campaigns in South Carolina. Marion became known as the Swamp Fox, and Lee and Marion would ultimately disrupt British supply lines, steal correspondence, and would even capture some of Charles Cornwallis's personal baggage from time to time. As this reliance on militia grew, Green started developing plans for a final battle, as he was already close to the Dan River and was about to cross into Virginia. One of the main strategies that he employed was by stealing the boats from local ferries, using them for his own use, and then burning them. This cost the British a lot of time that they could have used foraging because at this point they had shed most of their baggage in order to catch up to Green, but this would only end up starving the British soldiers. At this point, Tarleton had returned back to Cornwallis with what was left of his army, and the two ended up retreating to Wilmington, North Carolina to resupply and rethink their strategies. Ultimately, they would end up going after Green, who at this point had crossed the Dan River into Virginia. Green had won the race to the Dan, but he wouldn't get as many reinforcements as he had anticipated. However, the new supplies and arms was a welcome sight. 
Greene now felt confident in being able to attack the British, and Cornwallis felt confident in attacking the Americans too, even after receiving word that they had been reinforced and resupplied, and that Greene was marching into North Carolina to fight Cornwallis in open combat. There would be many skirmishes between the two armies leading up to March of 1781, but the Battle of Guilford Courthouse was set. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse was fought in March of 1781 and is one of the most important battles of the American Revolutionary War. This battle featured savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting, men firing on their own comrades and some of the worst fighting that's ever been seen in the southern colonies. This battle is famous for ultimately leading to the British surrender in Yorktown, Virginia just a few months later and for bringing an end to the bloody American Revolutionary War. Now this battlefield has also garnered a reputation for being one of the most haunted battlefields in the South. People have reported phantom smells, the sounds of battle, and seeing soldiers walking around even when there are no reenactors present. So the Battle of Guilford Courthouse was fought on March 15, 1781 between British forces led by General Charles Cornwallis and American forces led by General Nathaniel Greene, and it was the largest battle in the British Southern Campaign, which ultimately sought control over the Southern colonies where the British believed there was a large band of loyalists that would be loyal to the Crown and that they'd be able to reinforce their armies without having to wait for troops from England. So going into the battle, the British had about 2,100 men. Most of these were highly trained regular soldiers, and the Americans had about 4,500. Now, this seems like the Americans had an over two to one advantage over the British, but most of the American forces were made up of untrained and inexperienced militia. Typically, during the American Revolutionary War, the militia would flee at the first sign of the British bayonets, and typically in battle, they would only fire one shot before running back to their homes. Now that would put the Americans at a strong disadvantage because Green heavily relied on these militia to, in to inflict heavy casualties on the British before they reached the American regulars all the way at the third line. So about 200 yards down this road is where the American first line was stationed. So where I'm crouched down right now is roughly where the American first line would have been. Actually, more accurately, they would have been a little bit behind me, and they would have stretched way up that way and way down this way. Now, during the battle, this would have been farmlands. The Hoskins farm was a little bit this way, and the Hoskins family had actually moved here from Pennsylvania because when the Revolutionary War broke out in 1776, they wanted to get away from all the action, which ultimately their front yard would have become the largest battlefield of the American Southern Campaign. So the British would have been marching across an open field in this way, and roughly where I am right now, there would have been a large rail fence that would have stretched almost as far as the eye can see. And the American militia used this fence to hold their guns at, because muskets back then were not very accurate, especially at far distances. And what the American officers wanted to do is inflict as many casualties as possible on the British. Now, a few months earlier, back in January, General Daniel Morgan defeated Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton at the Battle of Cowpens. And Morgan was one of the first people to figure out how to use American militia effectively. And what he did was he had the militia fire one to two volleys and then fake a retreat. And this would have caused the British to charge after them, thinking they would have won a great victory and they wanted to claim the field. So what Morgan did at Cowpens was as soon as the militia ran, he set his Virginia sharpshooters at a second line to gun down the British officers, which would have caused chaos in the ranks. And then they would have fallen back. And as the British kept charging, they would have run into the Continental regulars, the best the Americans had to offer. Now, Daniel Morgan was not here at Guilford Courthouse, but the strategy that he used at Cowpens was essentially used by Green here at Guilford Courthouse here at the American first line. The idea was that the American militia, mainly Virginia militia and North Carolina militia, including roughly where I'm sitting, would have been the Guilford County militia. And the Guilford County militia was formed up by people that lived around here and they wanted to defend their homes from who they saw as British invaders. 
Now, the Americans wanted to get off one to two volleys, ideally two, to inflict as many casualties as possible, but according to eyewitness accounts and then reports by Cornwallis, General Leslie of the British, and by Green and many other commanders that were there, most of the militia only got off one volley before they ran. Now, what's also really cool, one of the reasons I picked this spot to sit here, other than the fact it's comfortable, is I had a few ancestors who fought here at Guilford Courthouse, and this is roughly the spot that they would have had their guns positioned along the rail fence. And it is really cool, almost 250 years later, to be exactly where they stood. And you know, we might be able to make contact with them or anyone else that was there that day, but that's part of the fun of being here. Around 11.30 a.m., the North Carolina militia spotted scarlet uniforms, burnished armor, and banners floating in the breeze. 400 yards to the west. The citizen soldiers watch anxiously as long columns of British soldiers advance with a firm step and full confidence in their prowess down the descent and across a small creek towards Joseph Hoskins' house. The wait was over. Cornwallis had arrived. This was the first time that they had encountered British regulars and some men were scared, but some men were eager to fight. The Hoskins farm and house had been used as headquarters by the British and at the end of the battle, it would also be used as a field hospital for wounded and dying soldiers. The opening shots would occur on the American left flank when Hessians would encounter the Virginia militia and Virginia marksmen under the command of Light Horse Harry Lee and Colonel William Campbell. Now, the Virginia long riflemen had some of the most accurate rifles in the world at that time, and their range was almost double what the regular muskets were, so they were able to open fire long before the rest of the militia were. However, once the British approached to within firing distance, over 1,100 muskets went off at once in what is described one of the largest volleys of the war, if not the largest. Many British regiments reported that over half, if not two-thirds of their units suffered either most killed or most wounded after this opening volley, including one of the British regiments reporting that over 180 men fell, either dead or wounded, from the single volley. Now, as for whether or not there was a second volley, it's somewhat of a historical mystery. It is reported that some Virginia and North Carolina militia units were able to fire two volleys, but most of them ran away after the first volley. You see, what would have happened after that very first volley was something that usually didn't happen to the British Army. They wavered. You see, the shock of 1,100 rifles and muskets going off at once caused even the most seasoned veterans to waver in their paths and even debate running away from the battlefield. This led to a series of confusing orders and events from British high command that typically didn't happen, especially when you look at battles such as Camden, Waxhaws, Saratoga, Brandywine, and Bunker Hill earlier in the war. Each British unit started issuing their own independent commands, and they really did not coordinate any attacks with each other. Some British regiments charged the militia. Some took a few steps back, regrouped, and then advanced again, not charging, not firing, but just advancing. And then some held their ground and started exchanging volleys with American militia. Aiding in this confusion was the fact that Cornwallis was assuming that everything was fine, and so he continued directing orders as if his whole army was marching as a single unit, when obviously this wasn't happening. One of the main units that the British anticipated doing well was a brigade of guards and the 23rd Regiment of Foot, along with the 33rd Regiment of Foot. Now, these three units were some of the best in the entire British army, and it was strange that they weren't performing up to snuff. On the American side, confidence was high, and most of the Virginia units held their ground, and some even started advancing behind the rail fence. While over on the North Carolina flanks, many of them started running away and panicking because they feared a British all-out charge on their position. Meanwhile, on the British side of things, some units retreated and then reformed and continued advancing. Some held their ground and returned fire, while others fixed bayonets and charged the Americans. Eventually, the British positions started becoming very fractured, and they started pursuing their own independent engagements, whether it be with North Carolina militia, Virginia militia, 
Virginia Sharpshooters, or the North Carolina Dragoons that had been posted with William Washington on the American right flank and the British left flank. Captain Kirkwood of the Delaware Regiment that was positioned on the first line, far right side, became involved in a hotly contested fight with two British regiments and he would lead them on a wild goose chase through the woods just north of the battlefield. This fighting would last all the way from the first line slightly north and then all the way to the American second line when he was reinforced by Virginia militia. After exchanging fierce volley fire with the American left flank, nope. After exchanging several volleys with the Americans, the British left flank decided to charge a North Carolina pol- I thought it was a mystery on the number of volleys. Huh? Well, the British fired a few volleys, the Americans didn't. Oh. Yeah. I'm not a historian, dude. I know you're not, but you're asking good questions. <laughs> now face the other way. <laughs> <laughs> After firing a few volleys into the North Carolina militia, the British left flank fixed bayonets and charged them as the North Carolinians were reloading. This caused most of the North Carolinians to flee, and this started a ripple effect that trickled down all the way to the Virginians on the American left. While the first line was crumbling, the Virginians were holding their ground, but they were about to become severely outflanked. They were still a part of a hotly contested fight with the Hessian soldiers, and at this point Cornwallis had dispatched some of his reserves to help remove the Virginians from the first line. A few confusing orders came to the Virginia militia, and Light Horse Harry Lee and his legion decided to take William Campbell and a few units of Virginia militia with him, and they formed their own separate defensive position to the east of the battlefield while most of the Virginia militia ran back to either the second line or the American third line. By this point, a lot of the fighting became fragmented and more of a running conflict. It wasn't so much of two lines firing against each other until one broke. It was some would fire, run, while the other position ran to within firing range, fired, and then reloaded. It was very confusing, and many of the units on both sides became lost and disorganized on the battlefield, especially when given the fact that even though a lot of the battlefield was rich farmland, there were still a lot of wilderness and wooded areas, which made it very tough for cavalry to get to the positions to save some of these militia units. So the fighting here at the American first line was very bloody, but also very quick. It was reported that when the very first American volley was fired, which was roughly 1,100 muskets going off at once, there was one regiment, the Van Bos Regiment, that reported over 180 men fell, either dead or wounded, after one volley. And many other British regiments, Hessian and British, reported heavy casualties after the first volley. Mainly up through here, it would have been firing guns at each other at about 30 to 40 yards. So, because of this combat, the battlefield, especially the first line, has gained a reputation as being one of the most haunted battlefields in the Carolinas. Some people report as they're walking on these trails that they will hear sounds of gunfire, they will smell gunpowder, and some people even claim to see American soldiers still holding their ground all these years later, waiting for a British attack that might come in the supernatural world, but won't come in our world. The story that stuck out to me are the reports that when people would be walking along this very trail that I'm sitting on, they would see American soldiers peering out from behind the trees as if they were looking for targets, British officers, to fire at. Now, since I'm here, I'm going to investigate claims of these activities or these sightings to see what I can find. So I'm sitting here at the American First Line, and I'm about to do my very first spirit box session of the day. Now, to my knowledge, this battlefield has not been investigated before, so I might be one of the very first people to ever do a spirit box session here. Hopefully, the spirits will be active. Are there any American soldiers here with us today? I thought I heard a voice today. I came here all the way from Virginia to talk to any spirits, American or British, that might be here. Can anyone say hello? That was a voice. Are there any American soldiers here? 
If there are any British soldiers here with us, can they please say hello? Did you hear that? That was a male voice. How are you doing today, sir? There are a few voices coming through. In this area, it would have been the Hessians, right? There would have been Hessian regiments marching through here, is that correct? Did anyone here fight under Colonel William Campbell? That's not like a female voice. My name's Jay, can you tell me your name? Who is your commanding officer? Alright, well if no one wants to talk, I'm going to leave here and go somewhere else. Do you want me to leave? That's kind of weird. Alright, well thank you for your time. I'm going to move somewhere else. Can you say goodbye? Alright, so we are getting a lot of radio interference, and that is because we are in, you know, Greensboro, North Carolina. And it is somewhat of a flat terrain, so radio is going to be something we're going to have to contend with today. Uh, we did get a few really interesting spear box responses. I thought I heard a few British accents in there, so that will be really, really cool if we can you know, go back, clean up the audio, and be able to verify, you know, what we got. But the fighting through here was very, very fragmented. You had the British, you know, two regiments would make contact with the American line. They would exchange some very rough fire, especially with the Virginia militia. And most of the British regiments, after the initial volley, they actually ended up just charging the American lines. And this was standard British practice against American militia because in the past, especially in the Southern Campaign, the militia had always fled at the first sign of the bayonet. Now the Virginians didn't necessarily do that at first, but then Colonel Lighthorse Harry Lee, who was stationed around this area, called the Virginians back and they formed their own little separate line of defense, which went against the plan that General Nathaniel Green had intended. And we'll get to that section here in a little bit, but I guess it's time for us to move to the American second line of action. So right now where I'm standing is roughly where the American second line would have been stationed. Now the original plan was for the second line to be reinforced by remnants of the Virginia and North Carolina militia from the first line. However, this didn't end up happening and the second line, mainly made up of Virginia militia, had to actually open up their ranks to let the North Carolinians that were fleeing back to the third line through, causing a big gap. So the Americans reformed their lines and they were waiting for the entire British army to meet them head on but they never did. In the first line, what ended up happening was a series of fragmented attacks, and this caused the British to meet the Americans at various points in time during the battle. So by the time the fighting was done on the American first line and the British started making their way to the second line, they actually did not reform their lines. Now, this was very strange because typically the British would. It was, you know, Charles Cornwallis, who was the commander of British forces, was one of the most brilliant tacticians the British had in their entire army. So why he didn't redress his ranks and continue the attack in order, we may never know. But ultimately what ended up happening is you would have one or two British regiments that would meet the American second line one or two at a time. Now, this seems good on paper, but what you would have happen is you would have a British regiment would meet the middle of the Virginia militia and the regiments on the flanks would wheel around to outflank the British regiments and pour fire on them from various angles. This is good because it does inflict severe casualties. However, when the British would bring reinforcements or the rest of the British army would meet the second line, the Americans would be outflanked. Now, combine this with a series of confusing orders, and this caused the American second line to crumble without doing as much damage as Green had hoped. 
You see, Green had an idea that by using the tactics Daniel Morgan had employed at Calpins, he might be able to pull a victory from the jaws of defeat, and he was counting on the Virginia militia at the second line to get this done. However, this did not happen. Somewhere in this area, the fighting became very, very close. Blue Jay. It would become very, very close. You would have people firing shots at point blank, sometimes within 15 to 20 yards of each other. Combine this with some confusing orders at the American right flank, and the second line here completely collapsed. Now, Cornwallis was starting to see a disaster looming, and so he started to mount his horse to ride to the British front lines to try and get everyone organized again. While all of this was going on, the British were still trying to advance across the field in order to catch the Virginians. But at this point, many of the Virginians started getting cold feet and started retreating. Now, they weren't retreating in the sense that they were throwing down their arms and completely running away. They were running back 50 yards, reorganizing, checking to see what the British were doing, and then they would either fire a volley and reload, or they would continue running. Some of them, like I said earlier, either went to the American second line, which was about 400 yards behind them, or they went all the way to the American third line, or they went with American Lieutenant Colonel Lighthorse Harry Lee and William Campbell's men to another part of the battlefield to set up their own defensive positions. Now, at Lee's position, he had some of the best sharpshooters in the American Army, and this garnered the attention of the Brigade of Guards, the Van Bose Regiment, and a few other Hessian units that quickly pursued them through thick woods and deep ravines. The Virginians at the American second line had heard the fighting that had taken place at the first line. They were only a few hundred yards behind, and even some of the British artillery fire had come close to the American second line. Now, the second line was led by mostly Continental officers, and a lot of these troops had seen combat before, so they were expected to fire off at least two to four volleys before retreating back to the American third line. The British expected to reform and then attack the, the American second line as one cohesive unit, but this did not happen due to the side conflicts that had emerged at the American first line. The Americans suffered far greater losses at the American second line, with many of their officers going down and the Virginia men panicking and running before they could fire off their third volley. There was even some bloody melee as some of the first line militia had tried to hold their ground with the Virginians on the second line, but they lost the will to fight and fled the battlefield. It's interesting to note that after the battle, American General Nathaniel Green wrote a report between 1,000 and 1,200 missing soldiers after the battle. These are men that were present at the start of the fight, but by the end, they had run away and would not rejoin the American army. The British fragmented attacks somewhat worked in a very strange way. You see, you would have two British units that would advance on the American positions, and even though the Americans had strict orders to remain in formation, some of the American units would wheel around to outflank the British. Now, what would end up happening is even though the British were outflanked temporarily, by the time the other British regiments appeared, they would outflank the Americans, which would throw the American second line into confusion and utter chaos. This caused the American second line to crumble long before Green had anticipated and would lead to the British not suffering as many casualties on the American second line as he had anticipated. Meanwhile, while the heavy fighting was going on at the American second line, the separate action became hotly contested and there would be a back and forth action between William Campbell's Virginia sharpshooters, the Brigade of Guards, and the Von Bose Regiment. It became very back and forth in the sense that the British would charge, the Americans would countercharge and fire some devastating volleys, the British would run away to a secure position, reform, the Americans would chase them, and then the British would chase the Americans back to where they had previously been. It was very, very confusing, and from a historical perspective, it's even more confusing to try and figure out exactly where these units were, simply because they were all over the place. Something that is interesting to note is that throughout the battle, Lighthorse Harry Lee did not deploy his cavalry at all. 
This could be because they had suffered decent casualties during the early morning skirmish against Tarleton's Legion, but this was more likely due to the fact that the Legion was not equipped to fight mounted in the wilderness, and most of his units, along with William Campbell's militia and sharpshooters, stuck to the woods in order to protect themselves from British charges. Had they stuck to the open fields and the roads, they would have been open to being charged by the British for what they would have definitely been defeated pretty easily, but they would have also been able to be supported by Lee's Legion cavalry, and they might have been able to completely rout the British southern flank, and this could have spelled disaster for the British that day. Paranormal claims that the American second line include seeing ghost soldiers, hearing sounds of battle, smelling gunfire, smelling rotting flesh, which is a very interesting thing to experience. And this is also the first location on the battlefield where we receive reports of a headless horseman being sighted. Now, as for who this headless horseman is, that is one of the many questions that we are going to try and solve during our investigation of the battlefield. But I suspect that it's either a member of William Washington's 3rd Light Dragoons or a member of Tarleton's British Legion. There is a chance that it could be a member of the North Carolina Mountain Militia simply because they would have been present in the area, but for most of the battle they actually fought dismounted. So the fact that this soldier is seen on horseback would lend to either William Washington's Legion or Tarleton's Legion. So after the second American line crumbled, there would have been running action from that direction where I'm standing all the way back to the American third line, which was over 200 yards in that direction. So what you would have seen is you would have seen individual regiments running across this ground, which would have been wooded during the battle. And you would have seen units occasionally stop, turn about, face the British who were coming from that direction. They would have fired, taken a few casualties because the British would have exchanged fire, and they would have continued running. Where I'm sitting right now is a little ways behind where the American second line was. Now, during the day's fighting, over in this area is where William Campbell and Light Horse Harry Lee's Virginians would have reformed and started moving towards the second line after defeating the Brigade of Guards and the Hessians. So, because this is a little bit behind the action, I don't think it'll be as active a sphere box session as to where if we were where the action is, but you never know. Let me actually turn the volume up a little bit. All right, hello, is there anyone here with us today? My name's Jake, and I'd like to talk to any soldiers that might have fought here at the Battle of Gifford Courthouse. Is anyone here? <laughs> Should have been right here. My name's Jake, and I come from Virginia. What's your name? Are there any British soldiers here? you can see or hear me, can you say hello? I keep thinking that I'm seeing stuff, but there are a lot of dead leaves and stuff that are waving around, and it looks like movement, so I have to keep an eye on that. Does anyone know where General Green is? Where are the British soldiers at? They're up. Should I go fight at the second line or should I reinforce the third line with the Marylanders and the Delaware Regiment? I had some ancestors that fought with the Augusta County Militia. Do you know who the Augusta County Militia is? I do. Well, thank you for, for your response. What's your name? Where are the Virginians? Where can I find them? Up north? 
north would be that way. Are you talking about the American right flank? Where's General Green? I need to talk to him. Soldiers there? I don't want to sound like voice said mm-hmm. There's a lot of radio interference, unfortunately. There is a yeah right there. Alright, well, we're going to go to the third line. Thank you to everyone who attempted to communicate with us, and you all have a good rest of your day. All right, so that was a pretty successful spear box session. I thought I heard someone say green, and what's very interesting when I asked where the Virginians were is when they said north. Now, I'm not very good with directions, but roughly north would be over there, which the American second line was made up of Virginia militia, which would have stretched from all the way down there to all the way up there. So technically, the Virginians would have been north of this position. So that is a really, really cool clip. Now, where I'm standing now is roughly where the separate action took place, but it is key to note that the separate action was more of a running fight that took place up to about five miles that way. After the American first line broke, it was basically cut utter chaos. General Light Horse Harry, actually Lieutenant Colonel Light Horse Harry Lee, took William Campbell and some of the Virginia militia and actually pulled them back here to the left about half a mile from the American second line. Now, why he did this, he wanted to form his own defensive position, and some people think that he didn't trust the battle plan of the American second line, and he didn't want to risk his precious, precious legion being destroyed. So he took William Campbell and his Virginia militia and his Lee's Legion infantry and dragoons, which is mounted infantry or cavalry, and they formed a defensive perimeter somewhere through this area. Now, they were followed by the Brigade of Guards, the Brigade of Guards Light Infantry, Hessians, and then eventually Tarleton's British Legion. And there was very, very fierce combat that took place through here. The Brigade of Guards started the attack by themselves, and they were quickly isolated, and the Virginians were able to rout them pretty quickly, and it was one of the few times during the war that the Brigade of Guards were routed. Now, they were reinforced by the Hessians, who were able to push back the Virginians, and the fighting quickly turned into a back-and-forth action. The British would push the Americans back with bayonet charges, and then the Americans would push the British back. Now, the fighting started about this area, and it kept going further and further away from the action. And something very interesting to note about the Battle of Gifford Courthouse is that the battle lasted several, several hours, you know, longer than most Revolutionary War battles. But the firefight over here, the separate action, as it's been come to known, actually ended long after the main fighting ended at the American Third Line, which was the end of the battle. So while you had Green and his men retreating out the retreat road by the courthouse, you still had intense fighting going on. So where I'm standing right now is about where the separate action took place. Now, Along this area, mainly where the cemetery over here is, is where Light Horse Harry Lee and his Dragoons and Legion Infantry, as well as William Campbell's regiment, mainly made of Virginia militia, they would have formed a defensive line over here against the British Brigade of Guards and the Hessian reinforcements that would have come from this direction. Now, towards the end of the battle, after the fighting at the courthouse had concluded, General Charles Cornwallis would end up sending the British Legion under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton with his cavalry down a road that used to be over in this direction, and Tarleton would ride through here with about 250 Legion Dragoons, and what he found when he got here was that the British soldiers had suffered heavy casualties and that they were pinned down by rifle fire on all sides. 
and Tarleton would ride through here with about 250 Legion Dragoons, and they would have broke the American lines. Now, there is a bit of controversy here because shortly before Tarleton showed up, Light Horse Harry Lee received intelligence that Green over at the courthouse had already retreated from the field, and he actually left William Campbell and the Virginians over a thousand men on their own, and they had no way to protect themselves against Bannister Tarleton's legion. So what would have happened is Tarleton would have charged them for about five miles that way, but during the pursuit, Tarleton would have two of his fingers shot off, and he would have to go back to the courthouse for military treatment. So while we're walking down this path, men would have been running for their lives in this exact area while swordsmen would have hacked them you know to pieces and the british regiment afoot the brigade of guards actually continued the assault while the hessians went back to the courthouse to resupply and reinforce so right now i'm going to do a spear box session here at the location of the separate fighting like I said a little bit ago, this is where Tarleton's Dragoons would have routed the American militia, and men would have been falling in this area where I am. So this is honestly, out of all the areas of Guilford Courthouse, this is the one I was most excited to do a spear box session at. And you can see it's somewhat secluded, you know, knock on wood, which... So hopefully we'll get something. All right, hello. Is there anyone here with us today? My name's Jake, and I'd like to talk to any soldiers that fought in the Battle of Gifford Courthouse. Are there any soldiers here? Now, close to where I currently am is where the separate action took place, where William Campbell's men were fighting the British Hessians and Brigade of Guards, and then they were chased by Tarleton's Dragoons. Are there any of Campbell's men here? Anyone here with the Von Bose Regiment? Did you hear that? That was a voice in me. Well, thank you, sir, for identifying yourself. What's your name? After this, I'm going to the American Third Line. If I went to the Third Line right now, what would be waiting for me? I heard a male voice say something. Alright, well I'm gonna go ahead and leave. Can you say goodbye? Okay, goodbye. So that session wasn't as active as the American Second Line was, which is kind of a bummer. I was really looking forward to potentially talking to my ancestors here, but hopefully the American Third Line will be the most active of them all. So close to where I'm standing right now is where the American Third Line would have been positioned. The American Third Line was made up of the best Continental soldiers, mainly the Maryland Regiment and the Delaware Regiment, as well as a few Virginia regiments. Now, these cannons right here are meant to represent the American artillery battery that was positioned in the middle of the Third Line. These artillery pieces would have been very vital to the American cause, and during the battle they would actually change hands about four or five times until they were eventually taken by Tarleton's Dragoons at the end of the battle. Now, if you were here on March 15th of 1781, what you would have seen is a line of Americans stretching all the way through here. And you see the British would have had to cross a little valley through a creek, a very treacherous creek, up a ridge in order to meet the Americans. And Green was hoping that he could exhaust the British units so that by the time they made it to the American lines and actually engaged them, they would have lost their will to fight. Now, unfortunately, this isn't what happened, and this is where the most intense fighting at the Battle of Gifford Courthouse would occur.
So in this area, there would have still been running fighting from the American second line as the North Carolina and Virginia militia tried to regroup with the American third line in this area. Now, in the 1880s, there were a few monuments that were erected on the battlefield, as well as the 1890s, and they actually put the American third line as being in this area. Now, this monument right here is to Lieutenant Colonel Stewart of the Queen's Guards, and they were involved in a very tight melee battle that occurred at the American Third Line where two American regiments combined with a few British regiments and there was a big bloody melee that took place and lasted for a very long time and it threatened to crumble both armies. Now during this fighting there was a legendary fight between Smith, Captain John Smith of the American side and Colonel Stewart of the British side, and Stuart would ultimately be killed after what was said to be a two to four minute long melee duel between these two commanders. Now, this is also known as one of the most haunted areas of the battlefield, simply because most people as they're walking, they do spend a lot of time here. There usually are a few more benches, so in terms of people encountering spirits, this would honestly be the best location to do that. Now, historically, we know that the American Third Line was more in that direction but it is still interesting that there are a lot of claims of paranormal activity in this area now at the american second line in this area and then back to the third line is where you start to see reports of a headless horseman entity being sighted by many park goers and even some park rangers As the last remnants of the second line withdrew across the valley, the Marylanders and Virginians steeled themselves for engaging the British infantry. Whether Green intended it or not, the British battle line had been broken into six separate elements that would arrive at different times. The 33rd Regiment of Foot was the first British unit to arrive at the American Third Line, and they were very quickly driven back. The 33rd Regiment of Foot, after being driven back, ended up reclaiming some high ground position and waited for British reinforcements. The Maryland Regiment and some Virginia units started marching towards the British, but they were quickly routed. The 2nd Battalion of Guards then rushed across the valley and routed the 2nd Maryland, taking Singleton's guns in the process. The 1st Maryland and Washington's 3rd Continental Light Dragoons, as well as the Marquis de Betonage, North Carolina, and Thomas Watkins, Virginia Horsemen, then piled into the guards, and what erupted was a very deadly melee, almost like a gigantic mosh pit that encapsulated most of the American Third Line, and it got so bad that Charles Cornwallis ordered most of his guns, his artillery pieces, brought up close to the action, and he would actually fire a grape shot into the mass melee. Now, even though this worked in routing the American Dragoons and infantry, it also enacted a heavy toll on his own men. Oh, you're still firing. Meanwhile, on the American right flank of the third line, fighting became very intense. Sergeant Major William Seymour of the Delaware Regiment had a very interesting account about this action when he wrote, Colonel Washington's light infantry on the right flank was attacked by three British regiments in which they behaved with almost incredible bravery, obliging the enemy to retreat in three different attacks, the last of which they pursued them up a very steep hill, almost inaccessible till in a very heavy fire on them in which they were obliged to retreat, having suffered very much by the last fire of the enemy. This is just one episode of many episodes as six elements of the British Army met the American Third Line. The climactic moment of the engagement was now at hand, and at this critical juncture, over 600 fatigued men were going to decide the fate of the battle, either a British complete victory or an American victory. Personally led by Brigadier General Charles O'Hara, who had been wounded earlier in the battle but was now fixed up and ready to go, would lead an attack against the American position and would ultimately begin crumbling the American line. 
Meanwhile, towards the American left flank and center of the line, there had been a fierce back and forth fighting at the American artillery pieces where some of the men would retake the guns and turn canister shot on the British while the British would, fierce, would mount fierce counterattacks and would retake the guns a few more times. The Second Maryland was not anticipating an attack by such a large amount of British units and they began to crumble, followed by the Virginians, then the Delaware Regiment. And this began almost like the American first line, a ripple effect down the American third line. And at this point, the American army was mostly in retreat. The Virginian Regiment attempted one last counterattack against the Brigade of Guards. And it was described as a disorganized volley, which meant that it was more of a ripple fire instead of an organized uniform volley. This would really have no effect on the Brigade of Guards, and the fate of the battle was basically sealed. Sensing imminent disaster, Green ordered a retreat. You see, part of his plan was to have a tactical withdrawal should things start to turn south, and most of his men, his officers, had been briefed on how to conduct this retreat. This ended up saving the American army from complete destruction, but it would not save the Americans that were fighting the separate action on the south end of the battlefield. Once the Americans had mostly left the battlefield, the British did attempt to pursue them, but Green had set up a fierce rear guard that was protecting the bulk of the American forces, and the British would eventually call off the attack. Most of the fighting at the Battle of Europe for Cornell at this point was concluded. Alright, hello, is there anyone here with us today? My name's Jake, and I'd like to talk to any American or British soldiers that might be in this area. Are there any soldiers here? Yes? Well, what's your name? Thank you for communicating. British. That's not like I said British. Are you a British soldier? Uh-huh. Did you fight with Webster's Brigade? That was a really good clip. It sounded like it said good morning in it, almost an English accent. Thank you for all these responses. I really appreciate it. So for all the British soldiers that fought here, was this the bloodiest part of fighting? Yes? Did you die here? I heard this is where there was a big charge against the Marylanders. Is this where you charged the Maryland Regiment? Are there any American soldiers here? Mm-hmm. What regiment did you fight with, sir? Does anyone know where General Green is? Up there? Is he up the ridge? What's really cool is historically that's where he would have been. So I'd like to know, yes or no, is this where the American third line met the British line? They didn't? Where did the fighting take place? Did you die here? A lot of people are going to see this. Is there anything you would like to tell people about the battle? Well, I'm going to move to a different spot. Thank you to everyone who communicated. Hey, hello. Are there any American or British soldiers here? My name's Jake, and I came all the way from Virginia to talk to any soldiers that might still be here. Is anyone here? <laughs> 
where I'm standing now is where the American third line would have been, or close to it. Is that true? Is this where the British line formed up to meet the Americans? Yeah? Did you die here? Is there anyone here from any of the Virginia regiments? Maybe? Where part of Virginia are you from? Can anyone tell me where General Nathaniel Green is currently? I don't know. Well, he's supposed to be back here with the third line, isn't he? Alright, well, I'm going to go ahead and leave here. Thank you, everyone who spoke. Can you say goodbye? Stop. Goodbye? That's a really good clip. Okay, goodbye. That was a really good session. Now, unfortunately, we do not know exactly where the courthouse stood here at Guilford Courthouse, where the battle gets its name from. But here in this area, aside from the courthouse, there would have been a total of about five or six buildings. There would have been the courthouse itself, which was a small one-room cabin. There was a little tavern nearby. There was a jail and then other miscellaneous buildings because this was also farmland. Now, something interesting historically is where the American Third Line, there was a slight rise. So... You can see a slight rise down there and a slight rise here. The Guilford Courthouse would have been a little bit behind, maybe about 30, 40 yards behind the retreat road, which is believed that the retreat road was maybe 20 or 30 yards up in this direction, and it actually extends way out that way. So in theory, the Guilford Courthouse spot would have to be somewhere in this area. My prediction, actually, I would believe it would be somewhere here in the woods. Now, unfortunately, it's a little too populated of an area to do a spear box session here, but if you look closely, you can see some irregularities in the terrain. As you can see, there is a slight slope up that goes here, and it does almost look like this would have been the spot where a building could have been, but you can also say the same for little areas such as this, especially since they have it cleared out. And unfortunately, we do not have an exact terrain map as to how it would have looked at the day of the battle, aside from a British engineer's map, so it is one of those historical mysteries that may go unsolved. The Battle of Gifford Courthouse was fought on March 15, 1781 and was the bloodiest battle in the American Southern Campaign. Now, this battle was the culmination of a few months chase between Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, American General Daniel Morgan, British General Charles Cornwallis, and American General Nathaniel Green in a race to the Dan. So one of the main reasons I came to Gifford Courthouse National Battlefield is one, because it's my favorite battlefield in North America, but also because there are a lot of amounts of paranormal claims that come from this battlefield, especially the fact that there is a Headless Horseman entity. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to figure out who the Headless Horseman was, but we were able to get some really cool Spearbox clips, and I cannot wait to go back home, edit them, clean them up, and then see what the soldiers were actually saying to us. It's, even if we didn't get as much activity as I had hoped for, it's still great coming down here for three great days of filming at my favorite battlefield, and hopefully I'll have an excuse to come back here again. But I hope you all have enjoyed this documentary as much as I did making it. Hopefully you learned something. And the Battle of Gifford Courthouse is very underrated in terms of its historical importance, especially in American history. A lot of very important things happen on this patch of ground that it just looks like any normal wooded area, but so many brave men lost their lives fighting for a cause they believed in. And that is worth making this documentary film.